What's up, Brozones? Welcome to the Ozone, and welcome to Felix the Shark! Oh my gosh! It's been so long since we've had a, a book to read uh, in Faz with Frights. Uh, if you didn't know, this book got delayed about four and a half, five months. It's crazy. Uh, and the weird part is, some people got access to it, like, four months ago. Uh, and so, I have read the leaks, unfortunately, because I couldn't resist not reading them, uh, and kind of covering it on my channel early. Um, but I am excited to read this still, because apparently it's a, it's a good book. Uh, I'm very excited to, uh, to see what other things it has in store. But it also, I, I bet it's a fun read. So, um, yeah. Are you guys excited for, uh, for Felix the Shark? I hope you are, because we're getting straight into it today. So, uh, yeah, make sure that if you enjoy this audiobook uh, slash read-through, you, uh, you like, you comment, and subscribe. Uh, I really appreciate all the support. Uh, for, uh, yeah, if you, if you like, I can make more. <laughs> uh, but yeah, we're starting with the first story, Felix the Shark, today. Um, and yeah, as I've said, I have already heard the main plot of this story. It's a pretty good one. It's it's pretty good. I'm not sure why these are scrapped stories, but um, yeah, they are. <laughs> anyway, let's go. Dirk knocked over Jenny's knight with his queen. Check. He shifted positions. He was getting stiff from sitting too long. Jenny sat on the other side of the low oak coffee table, her elbows propped on its surface, her square chin resting on her hands. She lifted a thick eyebrow and shrugged, then moved her own queen. Check. How long are you two going to do that? Jenny's twin, Gordon, asked. He was lounging against a pile of red pillows on the big black sectional sofa behind Dirk. You two are stuck in a loop. Isn't there a such thing as a perpetual check? Yes. Uh, Dirk flicked a look at his friend. We're not in perpetual check, he snapped. Actually, I think we are, Jenny said. We're not, Dirk said. A perpetual check only happens when no one can deliver a checkmate. It's not something that's called after just a few checks. Yeah, well, you're close enough, Gordon said. Face it, the game's a draw. Dirk shook his head several times. For as long as he'd known Gordon, which was close to a decade now, Dirk, Dirk had always found the guy's endless confrontations annoying. Maybe if Dirk had a wider circle of friends, he would have left Gordon behind long ago. But he didn't have that kind of choice. Dirk was part of a group of five friends who spent most of their off hours in the twins' basement apartment. The twins and Dirk's other two friends, Leo and Wyatt, were basically... Dirk's entire social life, and had been since junior high. They'd stuck together through high school and college, and now that they were supposedly adults, they were still together. Sometimes Dirk had to admit that his small circle of friends and their evening rut was a little lame, but he couldn't seem to change coming over here. He liked it. It was homey, and homey was something he'd never found elsewhere. Dirk glared at Gordon now. The rules of chess don't require a draw just because of a, of a perpetual check. That only happens when there's a threefold repetition, or if the 50 move rule is met. Okay, but you could agree to draw, Gordon said. Dirk frowned. We could, but giving up is a sign of weakness. Gordon snorted. Some would argue caring this much about a game is a sign of weakness. Chess is the sport of kings, Dirk shouted. He sat up straight and crossed his arms. It's a game of mastery and intellect and creative thinking. In fact, I think children should be taught chess in school. Some are, Jenny said. I just read about a special ed program where they're using chess to teach abstract reasoning and creative thinking. In fact, I'm putting together a proposal to take to the superintendent to see if he'll let me start a similar program. The kids I teach could use the focus. Good for you. Dirk said. As he often did, he lamented the fact that Jenny was just a friend. Back in high school, he tried to turn their friendship into something more, but Jenny had gently told him she loved him like a brother and only like a brother. For the last seven years, he'd been telling himself she'd change her mind eventually. That was why he'd stayed here to go to the same college she went to, 
why he was writing for the local paper instead of becoming the travel writer he wanted to be. Jenny caught Dirk staring at her and she gave him a raised eyebrow look. He flushed and shifted his gaze to Gordon, returning to his argument. I know how all of this feels. <laughs> uh, well, all kids should learn chess, uh, Dirk said. There's no debating it. The game is good for everyone. Everyone? Gordon rolled his eyes. Just because it's your opinion that chess is great doesn't mean everyone should have to do it. But I'm right, Dirk said. And I'm going to keep playing. He looked at Jenny. Okay, Jenny? Jenny yawned. Whatever, do what you have to do. Dirk chewed on his lower lip and started to reach out toward the chessboard. Before he could put his hand on the king, a red pillow landed on the board, scattering the few pieces that remained on it. Jenny didn't move when the pillow hit. She just calmly watched the chess pieces fly. Dirk, however, clenched his fists and whirled on Gordon, who was still on the sectional, one less pillow behind his head. Dude, what did you do that for? You were in perpetual check. I ended it. Gordon ran a blocky hand through his curly auburn hair. He wore a tight grey t-shirt, which looked too small on his bulging, grease-smeared biceps. Gordon was a mechanic, and he seemed to think being smeared with grease was cool. Dirk found the look desperate. It shouted, I'm cool. Notice me. We were not in perpetual check. Dirk ground out. Uh, he could feel the pulse throbbing at his temple. He hated things left unfinished. He liked things done, preferably triumphantly, but at least resolved. He couldn't stand unanswered questions. Now, this game would never be done unless he could recreate the board. He began gathering up the pieces. Don't even think about putting those back, Gordon said quietly. I'm tired of listening to you two check each other. Game's over. Who made you king of the hill? Dirk demanded. Uh, Gordon shrugged. My house, my rules. Our house, Jenny said. You have a different opinion? Gordon asked. I thought we were going to play caverns and crocodiles, Leo said before Jenny could answer her brother. He was sitting at the game table by the big stone fireplace at the end of the huge walkout basement that Gordon and Jenny's parents had turned into an apartment for the twins. Neither Gordon nor Jenny earned enough to have their own place. Dirk barely did, though the converted garage apartment he rented was hardly better than living on the street. That was why he was over here all the time, even though Gordon gone on his nerves. A fire crackled in the fireplace and the room smelled faintly of, wo of wood smoke. Leo was bent over a notebook, a thick pencil gripped tightly in his left hand. Even from across the room, Dirk could hear the scratching sound of Leo's pencil moving across the paper. I created a new character and the exterior door to the basement flew back and hit the wall with a bang. Wind whistled through the opening and tossed a dozen or so dry leaves onto the red and black linoleum that checkered the basement floor. The food hero cometh. Or, sorry, I have to sing it. Oh, no. The food hero cometh. Wyatt sang out, the usual big smile on his face. His brown eyes were bright with energy. Dirk thought Wyatt might be the happiest guy he'd ever met, although he had little reason for it. Wyatt was a computer nerd who worked in an electronics store, explaining technology to idiots. Dirk would never have the patience for that kind of job. Actually, I think he ariseth, Leo said without looking up from his notebook. He rubbed his right hand over the black bristles of his buzz cut, then cupped his equally bristly face. He did that a lot when he was thinking. If he was come -a thing he wouldn't already be here -th. Wyatt carried a stack of three pizzas in one hand. Two plastic grocery bags hung heavy from the other. Plastic soda bottles peeked out through one of the bag openings, chip bags through the other. Dirk finished picking up the chess pieces the pillow had tossed around, but he didn't put them back on the board. With Wyatt here now, they would probably play caverns and crocodiles after they ate. No more chess for tonight. That was okay. Honestly, Dirk had to admit he and Jenny were probably pretty close to a perpetual check. Gordon wasn't wrong when he'd said they were stuck in a loop. It would have been cool, though, to see if one of them had found a way out of it, lured the other into a false sense of inevitability only to claim victory at the last moment. It could have been a good story for Dirk's next Let's Play Chess column for the paper, but maybe if Leo really had created a new character for their game, 
Dirk could talk about that in his next Fantasy Games Enthusiast column. The last time he'd written that column, it had been about Caverns and Crocodiles, the tabletop role-playing game he and his friends had created based on the obscure novel called The Dogged Dogmatist, which Dirk had read and loved. The column had been surprisingly popular. Dirk had received dozens of emails and letters, asking all kinds of questions about the novel and how Dirk had come up with the twists and turns in this game. I just have a knack for in intuiting clues, Dirk had told his fans. Dirk didn't get a response like that to his writing very often. It had been pretty cool to find out people actually read what he wrote. The thing was that most of the time people tended to ignore Dirk, especially when he talked. He wasn't sure why. Yeah, he knew he was kind of a dork. He was a little guy with big ears and hair that would never lay down straight. Uh, he had pr a pronounced overbite that made him look like a little a uh, little like a chipmunk. A reality sadly worsened by the fact his hair was chipmunk coloured. Not classic good looks for sure, but even that couldn't fully explain why people didn't want to listen when he talked. He thought he had a perfectly fine voice, not squeaky or anything. Wyatt stepped over to the game table and set the pieces, pizzas in the middle of it. He looked down at Leo's notebook. Writing a new masterpiece? Leo glanced at Wyatt. New character for Caverns and Crocodiles. Dirk got up and offered a hand to Jenny. She didn't need it. She was a gymnast. She coached at the high school where she taught, and she could probably have done a backflip to her feet. Dirk, however, would take any excuse to hold her hand, even for a second. Jenny accepted his help. Her palms felt rough with calluses when he pulled her up. She dropped his hand and Dirk headed toward the bar counter. The pizza smelled amazing, onion, green pepper, pepperoni, but he could also smell the ham and pineapple on the pizza Gordon and Jenny always got. Dirk reached behind the bar counter to grab a stack of napkins and a couple of baskets. He handed the baskets to Wyatt who dumped in the chips. Dirk got the sodas out of the other grocery bag and grabbed a stack of plastic cups. This well uh, choreographed uh, food routine was done with no talking. They'd been through it often enough that they needed no discussion of who was doing what. At the game table, Jenny was setting out paper and pencils for their game. Gordon was at the stereo setting up the night's music. Leo was the only person without a task to fulfil. This was because no matter how many times you asked him to do something, he never got it in his head that he could do the same thing the next time. Leo was an amazing storyteller. He wrote and illustrated comic books. He already had one published and it was doing so well that his future seemed pretty well set. Honestly, Dirk was more than a little envious of Leo's success. It wasn't like Leo's life was great or anything. He was an awkward guy like Dirk and he lived at home. Still, Dirk longed for the day he could write his own book instead of writing about other people's books. There was something about all Dirk's friends that kept them out of mainstream society, kept them from going out on their own and actually having a life worth talking about. Jenny threw all her energy into the kids she taught and coached, so she didn't have much time for anything else, even romance, although the romance thing was compounded by the fact that Jenny resembled her brother. On Gordon, squareness and toughness worked. He was short, but broad and muscular. He looked like a little commando. Jenny had pretty green eyes, but her muscular body mass and rough features made her unattractive to many guys. In high school, the kids had nicknamed her Troll. Dirk thought that that was mean, and he hated it on her behalf, but she didn't seem to care. Jenny kind of lived in her own world. In high school, Gordon had been the star of the wrestling team, but even so, he hadn't been popular. Gordon had an obsession with conspiracy theories, so he was never des <laughs> destined to fit in. The first time the other jocks invited him to their table at lunch, he had droned on about how extraterrestrials had in infiltrated the government, that a race of people lived in the centre of the earth, and that a good, good proportion of uh, society had been replaced by androids. He'd never gotten another invitation to sit with them. I'm not surprised, mate. <laughs> These days, Gordon had spent his time working on cars or hanging out in his apartment, though he was still seeking a willing audience for his theories. Wyatt was the most recent addition to Dirk's group of friends. 
recent being a relative term. Dirk met Wyatt their senior year in high school, but, but by then, Dirk was living in a foster home. His parents had passed away in a car accident when he was eight, and then his aunt, who'd taken him in, died of cancer when he was in high school. Wyatt's family had moved into the house next to Dirk's foster home. Wyatt was really smart and had skipped two grades already. The school wanted to advance him even further, but his parents didn't think he was ready socially, and they were right. When Wyatt tried college the following year, he hated it. He ended up dropping out and getting the job he had now. His parents were very disappointed in him, a fact that in no way quelled Wyatt's daily delight. Others might see these quirks as too unique to meld well together, but in truth they were the only reason why, Dirk's, why Dirk even had a group of friends. Dirk wouldn't fit in with a group unless, it, unless all its members had some quality that disqualified them from being normal. Not only did Dirk's looks prevent him from wearing that label, his interests did as well. In addition to chess and fantasy games, Dirk was into science, biology, chemistry and physics, uh, semiotics and puzzles, uh, butterflies, sharks, and mysteries of all kinds. Sharks! Oh my god. Uh, he, he was in clubs for... Sorry if that was loud, by the way. I leaned into my microphone, not thinking of the consequences. Um, he was in clubs for those things, and in high school, he'd been on the debate, the debate team too. His debate skills had no outlet now, except with his friends, and maybe in his newspaper columns. Tonight, Dirk was going to need those skills. He was hoping to talk his friends into helping him with a project, one he'd been thinking about for a while now. He'd been dreaming about it too. For some reason, he felt compelled to... Earth to Dirk, Wyatt said. Huh? Dirk looked around and noticed he was the only one not seating at the game table. Flat Earth to Dirk. <laughs> are you in your napkins being antisocial tonight, or are you going to join us? Gordon asked. Dirk glanced down at the stack of napkins he still held. He laughed. Sorry, I was thinking about a new club I want to start. Gordon groaned. Another one? Isn't there a limit on how many clubs a person can be in? You know, like you can only have so many animals, like that. Dirk pulled out the last red tweed covered plush chair at the games table. He parceled out the napkins and accepted the slice of pizza Jenny offered him. Thanks. I don't think the government regulates how many interests a person can have, Wyatt said. He smiled at Dirk. I think it's cool you're into so many things. You're like a renaissance millennial. Do doesn't a renaissance man, millennial or not, have to have talent or knowledge, not just interest? Gordon asked. A chorus of, woo, rose up from the table. Jenny smacked her brother's arm. Don't be mean. Dirk's face got hot, and he looked down at his pizza so no one would notice. Unfortunately, when his face got hot, his ears did too. He was pretty sure they were bright red. Wyatt leaned over and nudged Dirk. Don't let him bother you. I don't think someone who believes his boss is an android has a strong grasp on reality. Wow. I heard that, Gordon, uh, Gordon said. Why aimed his 300 watt smile at Gordon? I figured you would. I was doing that thing. What's it called? He snapped his fingers. Talking smack. I was talking smack to you. Gordon shook his head and took a bite of pizza. Old man Vance is definitely an android. You'll see. Someday, one of his customers is going to, sh <laughs> to short out his circuits. He'll be all. He throws his face in a contorted position and sparks will come out of his ears. Sorry, I, I'm i laughing because I read that. <laughs> and I'm thinking of old man consequences, and maybe this could be a, cro a crackpot theory. Old man consequences is definitely an android, meaning old man consequences is a robot. Huh? Huh? <laughs> You're so beyond weird, there's no word for you, Jenny said to her brother. Thank you. Speaking of robots, Dirk said, thrilled to have an unexpected opening for what he wanted to talk about tonight. Do any of you remember going to a Freddy Fazbear's pizzeria when you were little? Freddy's! Wyatt shouted. Yeah, we went to one when we lived in Iowa. Huh. I loved Chica so much my mum made uh, my fifth birthday cake in the shape of one of Chica's cupcakes. He beamed at the memory. Leo, who had been scribbling in his notebook with one hand and eating chips with the other, looked up. I'd forgotten all about Freddy's, but yeah, now I remember. I loved the Freddy's colouring books. 
That's what started my drawing. Eventually I got tired of colouring and just drew the figures. My favourite was Foxy. Same. He was kind of the inspiration for Scythe Man. Dirk thought about the purple clad superhero in Leo's comic. The character had a scythe attached to one arm. Yeah, I can see that. It's kind of like a grim foxy design, I guess, Dirk said. I don't remember colouring books, Jenny said. The Freddies that Gordon and I went to didn't have any. But we loved the games, didn't we, Gordon? Remember the climbing bars? How could I not, Gordon said. You'd swing straight up to the top like a monkey, and then mum would yell at me for letting you go up there, like I could have stopped you. Jenny laughed. She took a swig of orange soda. I loved the music too, and the dancing. Gordon didn't care about that, but he was fascinated by the animatronics. Obviously, Wyatt said. Everyone nodded. Dirk watched Gordon's gaze drift toward the fireplace. His brows came together, and Gordon looked back at his friends. I wonder if the android takeover started at Freddy's. Dirk groaned. No, seriously, Gordon said. The guy who started the Freddy's chain was way ahead of his time with animatronics. Clearly, he had to keep things rudimentary for the public. But what if he had an underground laboratory? What if he created the first wave of Android Army? No one had a comment on this, so Dirk jumped in. I was thinking it would be fun to start a Freddy Fazbear Club. Yeah, because you're not in enough clubs, Jenny said. She winked at Dirk to let him know she wasn't dissing him. He appreciated that. Or, uh, well, we all have good memories of Freddy's, right? Dirk looked around at the table. Everyone nodded. I think I still have a plush Freddy in my closet. <laughs> Simon? Uh, no, Jenny admitted. Uh, comment if you get that. JK, you probably will get that. Uh, Dirk grinned. That's funny you mention it. I just came across my plush Felix, and that's what got me thinking about Freddy so much. I even had a dream about him, and I tried to- Who's Felix? Wyatt asked. Dirk looked around the table at his friends. They all had blank expressions on their faces. Jenny reached out for another piece of pizza. Gorn picked up his root beer to take a drink. Felix, Dirk repeated. You know, Felix the shark. Gordon guffawed and spewed root beer all over the game table. Leo yanked his notebook back a second too late. Hey, Leo said. He quickly grabbed a napkin and wiped off his scribblings. What's so funny? Dirk asked. He could feel his face and his ears heating up again. Freddy's didn't have a shark, Gordon said. Yes, it did, Dirk insisted. Gordon looked at the others. Anyone else remember a shark at Freddy's? Leo and Jenny shook their heads. How old were you when you went to Freddy's? Jenny asked Dirk. He twisted his mouth and thought, I think I was five, maybe. Where were you? Dirk shook his head. I don't remember. We were on the road a lot back then. What do you mean, on the road? Wyatt asked. Dirk didn't want to talk about his childhood, so he picked up his cup and took a sip of cola. He also deflected the question. None of you remember the Felix the Shark and the moat he swam in? Leo star uh, stared at Dirk. He picked up his pen and started writing furiously. What are you doing? You just gave me an idea for a story, Leo said. Great imagination, dude. D Dirk slammed his cup down on the table. Cola sloshed out. It's not my imagination, he shouted. Felix was real. He looked at his friends. They all stared back at him with wide eyes and open mouths. Gordon tilted his head the way he often did when he was examining a suspected android. Great. Now Gordon was probably wondering if Dirk was an android too. Dirk took a deep breath and spoke in a quieter tone. I don't mean real, real. Felix was an animatronic, just like Freddy and Chica and Bonnie and Foxy, but he existed. I'm not making him up. No one said anything. You really don't remember? He asked. Everyone shook their heads. Dirk could feel his anger rising. Were they uh, why, why were they acting uh, so abu ab abuse? Why were they acting so obtuse? How could anyone forget Felix? He stood up so abruptly, so that, that he knocked his chair over. You don't remember the moat thing? The entrance to Freddy's led to steps that went down under the moat thing and came back up on the other side. Remember? More head shaking. See, Felix was inside this moat-like thing. I mean, it, it wasn't really a moat. It was, a moat's more like a trench than this ever was. 
It's more like an encapsulated river. It had a current, but the current wasn't super fast. The tube encircled the entire restaurant. It was a tube made of the kind of glass they use for aquariums. You could see into the water from anywhere in the restaurant. It was cool. He checked his friends again. They were still staring blankly at him. He rushed on. The water was totally enclosed. Felix never left the tube, but you could go into the tube and swim with him. Gordon barked out a single laugh. You are so full of- In an enclosed tube? Wyatt asked. Wouldn't you drown? No, I'm, I don't mean swim, Dirk corrected. His voice was getting loud again. He could hear it, but he couldn't stop it. I mean, like scuba dive. You'd put on swim trunks and they'd hook you up to a breathing tube. There was this hatch that opened up, and you hopped in, and the attendant closed the hatch. Then you swam along the tube. You've got to be making this up, dude, Leo said. Are you sure this wasn't some dream you had when you were little? Jenny nodded. Yeah, it sounds like maybe a little kid fantasy that you mistook for real life. I don't think he mistook anything, Gordon said. I think he's totally making the whole thing up just to mess with us. <laughs> it's another conspiracy. I'm not making it up, Dirk yelled. Gordon raised his eyes in a placating gesture. Placating. Uh, everyone else just kept staring at Dirk. Dirk frowned. I might not have the details right about the tank, but I know I swam in it. And obviously I didn't drown, so there had to be some kind of oxygen hookup. And I sure didn't imagine Felix. Felix would swim alongside you when you were in the tube. What did this supposed shark look like? Gordon asked. Supposed? Dirk ground his teeth. He could feel his shoulders rising up to his ears and he forced them back down. Gordon shrugged. Dirk gave Gordon a scathing look and said, Felix was kind of bluish grey, about six feet long. He was a shark. You know what a shark looks like. He was an animatronic. He opened his mouth. He looked around. He swam. Just like a real shark. Wouldn't a real shark eat you? Leo asked. Sharks don't eat humans, Dirk said. Sharks don't even like the taste of humans. Tell that to the surfers who have been attacked by sharks, Gordon said. Dirk shook his head. When a shark attacks a human, it's usually because they, they, they are confused or curious. They basically take a test bite to see if we taste good, and unfortunately that bite can be fatal or can at least remove parts people would rather keep. But really, humans are far more dangerous to sharks than they are to us. Think about it. Humans hunt sharks for everything from shark fin soup to lubricants to health supplements. I love that Scott is doing this. <laughs> Scott is like the leading awareness company that is uh, making us aware of, like, don't kill sharks. Um, well, we can always count on Dirk for useless trivia. It's not useless, <laughs> Gordon said. Dirk ignored him. Felix was a programmed shark, and obviously they didn't program him to eat the kids who got in the tank with him. That would be bad for business, Jenny said. Leo tried to contain a giggle by scribbling something down in his notebook. But did he have teeth like a shark? Wyatt asked. Dirk nodded. Sure. Gordon shrugged. Well, I can think of at least a dozen ways an animatronic like that could go wrong. Just like Fred Bear. Jenny nodded. I agree. She looked at Dirk. You do realise how crazy dangerous what you're describing would be. I can't even imagine how they could safely build such a thing, even back then. And for, li and for little kids, even without the shark, the swimming tube would be a horribly, uh, would be a horrible idea for kids. We're talking liability issues galore. Of course you'd go there, Dirk thought. The twins' parents were both attorneys. I'm not making it up, Dirk insisted. This is reminding me of like the Disneyland incidents. I believe there's like a whole Wikipedia page that's like full of like people who have like had injuries and have died at Disneyland. And it's like really like dark and scary. Uh, I can imagine like, yeah, because Disneyland isn't even that like unsafe, right? Um, but, like, the fact that you would have, like, a tube with, like, a shark following you with, like, these fangs or, like, teeth, uh, not fangs, uh, it, that's kind of, like, yeah, that's, that's definitely gonna have some incidents, right? There's no way no one died in that tube. Maybe it was why it was shut down. I don't know. I don't think you're trying to mess with us, Jenny said. She screwed up her face. I just, so you're saying little kids, like, five years old. 
like you were, wanted to get in this enclosed tank and swim with a big robotic shark? Gordon asked. Y yeah, Dirk said in a what of it tone. Leo looked up from his notebook. That would be scary as hell for a little kid. Never mind a little kid, Jenny mused. I'd be terrified now being an enclosed thing of water like that with a shark swimming with me. I wouldn't care if I was an an if if I was an animatronic if it was an animatronic. And I know what you said, Dirk. She smiled at him. But sharks are just plain scary. Felix wasn't scary, Dirk objected. You could see in his eyes that he was friendly. I mean, he was programmed to be friendly. I liked Felix. I have good memories of him. Dirk felt himself getting choked up, and he cleared his throat. I thought of Dirk, uh, I thought of Felix as a kindred spirit. We were both outcasts, both misunderstood, not wanted. Dirk pressed his lips together and blinded so he wouldn't get teary. He lifted his gaze and looked at Jenny. She bunched up her eyebrows. Maybe Felix was your childhood way of creating an ally when you didn't have one. I think Jenny has a point, Wyatt said. Sounds like your subconscious made this character up to help you cope. It makes sense. Our minds do incredible things to get us through life. My subconscious mind did not come up with Felix, Dirk shouted. For several seconds, no one said a word. The music on the stereo continued to play some rock band wailing about love. The fire continued to dance in the fireplace. A log shifted and it hit the bottom of the grate with a thump and several pops and cracks. Dirk could barely hear those sounds, though, because blood was rushing through his head so quickly it sounded like a fast-paced version of Felix's swimming tube. So, none of you believe me? Dirk asked, because everything seemed muted. He spoke loudly. He looked at each friend in turn, starting with Jenny. She frowned and looked away. Beside her, Gordon crossed his arms and shook his head. Dirk wanted to punch his friend in the nose. The guy who believed the creator of Freddy's invented an android army refused to believe Dirk's story. Yeah, that made sense. Dirk looked at Wyatt. Wyatt's smile was still in place, but it looked a little with wilted. Uh, he gave Dirk an apologetic shrug. Maybe if you could remember where the Freddy was. I mean, Freddy Faz... Uh, sorry, Fazbear Entertainment came up with some pretty cool things. It's possible one of their pizzerias had the moat thing you're describing. You really have no idea where it was? Dirk shook his head, and his shoulders slumped. Then he straightened them. But that's one of the reasons I wanted to start this club. If you help me, I'm sure we could find all the old Freddy's locations, and we could track down where Felix was. He waited for his friends to tell him what a great idea that was. No one said anything for a couple seconds. Then Leo spoke up. That sounds like the kind of tilting out. That sounds kind of like tilting at windmills or searching for Atlantis, dude. Yeah, it's just that it's just like that treasure hunt you wanted us to go on last year. God, I'm messing up my words, sorry. Gordon said, Would have been a lot of work for nothing. Dirk looked at his other friends. No one wants to help you find Felix? Jenny sighed. No one wants to look for something that probably exists only in your imagination. You do have a great imagination, Leo said. I can work Felix and the moat into my latest story. I'd give credit to you, Dirk, obviously. Dirk didn't respond, but Leo went on. Maybe we can sit down together and you can tell me how, in how you envisioned the moat thing. I didn't envision anything, Dirk bellowed. That was it. He was done. Dirk went to stand up and realised he was already standing. He'd never sat back down. Good. That meant he could leave faster. Dirk swivelled and strode away from the game table. Dude, Gordon called. Where are you going? Maybe to find Felix. I don't know. Dirk flung over his shoulder. He couldn't remember the last time he'd been so outraged. He felt totally and completely dismissed. He hated that feeling. Dirk charged across the basement, grabbed his coat from the bench by the door, and reached for the doorknob. When Dirk got back to his pathetic garage apartment, there was no warm glow in the windows. No one was ever waiting at home for him. Dirk stepped out of his old, battered car. The driver's door squeaked when he closed it. He wanted to slam the door, but when he slammed the door on his temperamental, compact sedan, it tended to stick. It, he wasn't in the mood to crawl back into his car from the passenger side tonight, because he was going back out as soon as he could pack a bag. Unlocking the door, Dirk stepped into his place. He called it an apartment, but that made the space sound fancier than it was. It was just a square room, 
with a tiny bathroom stuck in the back corner. His kitchen was a sink, a small fridge and counter made from an unfinished door set on sawhorses. Uh, a hot plate on the tile on one end of the door surface was his stove. Dirk's whole place still smelled like the eggs and bacon he'd made for breakfast that morning. The digital clock next to his sofa bed told Dirk it was only 1.35am, no joking, 8.35pm. <laughs> uh, on Saturday evenings like this one, he was never usually here at this early hour. He was always at Gordon and Jenny's place. Dirk hadn't had a home, a real home, well, ever. Sure, his aunt tried to give him a home, but she wasn't cut out to raise a kid. She'd always been distant and formal with him. In the nine years he'd lived with her, he'd always felt like a guest. He lived in fear of breaking one of her knickknacks or staining her upholstery. Don't know what that word means. Uh, and before that, when his parents had still been alive, he'd never had a home then either. None of Dirk's friends knew about his past and he wanted to keep that away. Uh, it was, it was too weird. Dirk's mum and dad had put together a magic act before Dirk was born. They'd run away from home together. <laughs> I was just about to make a joke about that. Um, and then it was actually a thing. Uh, they'd run away from home together right after high school graduation and they'd supported themselves by doing magic shows all over the country. Oh! Oh! Okay, never mind. It wasn't the joke that I thought it was going to be. I thought it was going to be like... They managed to disappear. <laughs> they, they made themselves disappear. Uh, when they had Dirk, they weren't about to let a baby hold them back. They just included him in their show and that's when they started making really good money. People flocked from all over to see the amazing disappearing baby and later the amazing disappearing toddler. All was going well until a social worker took exception to five-year-old Dirk being sawed in half. Child Protective Services got involved and his parents took him out of the act. From that point on, they'd started leaving him with either his aunt or some babysitter while they did their thing. They'd probably still be on the road if it wasn't for a, brown, a blown tyre. Their car had gone over the side of a long drop-off and this time Dirk's parents were the ones who did the disappearing. Dirk had never forgiven his parents for going back on the road without him. If they hadn't, they wouldn't have died and left him alone. He'd never gotten over his belief that their magic act was more important to them than their son. True. Uh, <laughs> Dirk knew he'd let this belief pretty much ruin his life, or run his life, sorry. Uh, he was self-aware enough to realise his past fueled his need to be right all the time. He also knew that spending his formative years in a magic act was, re uh, was responsible for his res obsession with puzzles, mysteries and the unexplained. It was like he was a magnet for the bizarre. Maybe that was why he'd loved Felix so much. And now his need to be right, his interest in mysteries and his love for Felix was sending him on another journey. Dirk opened the rickety fake wood cabinet that served as his closet. Pulling out a canvas duffel bag, he crossed the green indoor outdoor carpeting covering the garage or carpeting covering the garage's hard concrete floor. At a small desk on the opposite side of the room, he set down the duffel and opened the top drawer. He pulled out a ledger type leather book. He put that in the bottom of the duffel bag and packed what he'd need for a couple weeks' travel. When he finished packing, he dug out the shoebox he kept his savings in. A quick count of his money came up with just over a couple thousand dollars. It sounded like a lot, but gas and food and motel room costs could add up fast. He'd have to be careful. A few moments later, he began gathering some other things. His sleeping bag, a jacket, a hat and gloves, a flashlight and batteries, and his phone. Once that was done, he stuffed in a grocery bag's worth of munchies like crackers, chips, nuts and dried fruit. Dirk looked at his packed duffel bag and the stack of supplies next to it. He glanced around his place one more time. His gaze landed on a framed photo of his parents sitting on his desk. He stepped over and picked it up. He snapped his fingers and opened the chest that sat under his only window, lying on top of a pile of games and old toys, a matted and threadbare plush blue-grey shark with a limp dorsal fin lay on its side. Dirk picked it up and tucked it in his duffel. He was ready. He would find the Freddies that was home to Felix the Shark. 
Dirk was hesitant to tell his friends for fear of opening up the wounds from his childhood, but he already knew, uh, but he already had a few good guesses where Felix could be. He'd been using good old fashioned research to retrace his parents' travels for months now, ever since he started having dreams about Felix. Dirk wasn't sure why the dream started. Was it because he was becoming more and more aware of how stuck he was in his life? How he was going nowhere? Had that made him want to go back to his origins for some reason? Whatever had caused the dreams, at one point he'd gotten out of the box that contained the few things his parents had left to him. Under his dad's goofy top hat, a small jewellery box filled with his mum's costume jewellery, and a couple of warped yellowing photo albums, he found a ledger that kept track of their performances. That was the leather book he'd already put in his duffel. It was filled with lists of places and dates. He was pretty sure he'd been five when he swam with Felix, but he might have been a year or two younger or maybe a year older. Not any older than that. He remembered the last two years of his time with his parents very well, and Felix wasn't one of those memories. So he figured he'd have a th he had a three-year window to look in, and in those three years, his parents had performed in 17 states. He booted up his ancient computer and ran a search of the Better Business Bureau's record of Fazbear Entertainment. These resources gave him a list of every Fazbear Entertainment venue, restaurant locations and manufacturing and distributing locations, but they didn't reveal what attractions or animatronics were at those locations. Distribution center! No, I'm joking. <laughs> Maybe. Uh, Dirk turned his attention to online forum posts by former employees of the company to see if any could remember which franchise had an animatronic shark, but he only found a handful of posts and none of them mentioned Felix. Thanks for nothing. He really only had a, a one option left, retrace his parents' steps. Thankfully, he had a way to do that. This whole thing felt like the worst rejection of his life. Dirk was telling the truth and he knew what he rem and he knew he remembered correctly what had happened. It infuriated him to be disbelieved. He had to prove that he was right. Using his mom's performance records combined with the research he'd done on Fazbear Entertainment, Dirk was able to confine his search area to a handful of towns. It was a matter of overlapping the bubbles. The towns that had a Fazbear franchise were in one bubble. His mom's performance dates were in another. Thankfully, only seven towns were in the overlap. It's a Venn diagram. <laughs> Today marked the 11th day Dirk had been on the road and he was heading into his sixth town. Because he had just two towns left to visit, Dirk was getting a little nervous about his overlapping bubble theory. It would only work if he had complete lists. If he didn't have all the Freddy's locations or his mum had left a stop of her list, he was screwed. His spirits were low. But that might not have had anything to do with his search. It might have had to do with the depressing places he was visiting. Take the town he was closing in on now, for instance. Forkstop, which amazingly wasn't on the list of worst town names ever, Dirk had checked, was once a booming community built around the manufacture and sale of farming equipment. Although it sat in the middle of the country, surrounded for endless miles by nothing but farmland and empty fields, it apparently used to have one claim to fame. It had been the birthplace of an infamous outlaw who had terrorised the, mid the Midwest in the late 1800s. The guy, Floyd Crawberry, had been no Billy the Kid, but he'd apparently done some heinous things, so the town had tried to create a tourism industry based on him when demand for fork stops farming equipment dwindled. This had worked to an extent, but developers tried to go too far too fast. Driving through, most of the Crawberry attractions were as defunct as the manufacturing plants. However, Knowing the history hadn't prepared him for how much despair radiated from Forkstop. Wait. He's... Oh, I think there's a, like, a mistake here. I think that's supposed to be a comma. He started feeling it before it, he even got to the city limits. Oh, I don't, I don't know. I, I think I'm just reading it wrong. Uh, Forkstop was unlike the last few towns Dirk had driven through. Those had been surrounded by sprawling farms preparing for the fast approaching winter, their rolling dry hills dotted with tidy small homes and barns of various sizes. Forkstop didn't have any farmland close to its boundaries, just empty buildings. Dirk dutifully 
uh, let up on the accelerator as he passed a low building with a caved in roof and a reduced speed ahead sign by the road. He was a stickler for speed limits. The cost of fines for speeding wasn't in his budget. As he slowed to the limit set on the next sign, he noticed that the dilapidated uh, buildings had sort of phalanx feel to them. <laughs> what is a phalanx? <laughs> a phalanx feel? I don't know. Three rows of abandoned buildings flanked the road leading into the town, as if they were set up in formation to protect the town from invaders. As he passed the weathered, graffiti-covered structures, he half expected an army of android troops to start pouring out of them. He could picture the lurching, robotic soldiers descending on his poor little sedan, ripping off its doors and pulling him out onto the pavement. Dirk shivered. Get a grip, he told himself. You've been listening to too many of Gordon's stupid theories. Maybe it's the weather, he thought. Today, in addition to heading into a dying town, Dirk was feeling crushed by a grey sky that seemed so low he could actually feel it pressing down on him. Or at least, he thought he could. On top of the intrusive heavy grey above, a stiff wind was blowing. Leaves and twigs and trash blew across the roadway at regular intervals. The wind buffeted... <laughs> am I thinking about buffets? Mm, yes, I am. The wind buffeted... Dirk's little car and the gusts' high-pitched whistle slithered in around the door seals, giving Dirk the willies. He couldn't wait to find a motel and get inside a nice quiet room away from his car and the melancholy weather. In the last two towns, Dirk had slept in his car just outside of town because the motel rates had been too high. He wanted to sleep in a real bed tonight and he needed to shower. He ho <coughs> Sorry. He hoped a run downtown like this would have some old place with cheap rates. Dirk reached Forkstop city limits and passed by a faded welcome to a Forkstop population 4,251 sign and began looking around. Usually budget motels are right on the outskirts of these old towns. Dirk hit the brakes and took an abrupt right turn. Tucked in behind what looked like an empty warehouse, a neon sign with a blinking arrow announced Hotel Cansey. Figuring that a hotel with a broken neon sign wasn't going to change, oh, sorry, charge big bucks. Dirk aimed his sedan toward the sign and saw that the arrow pointed to a small roadside motel called Crawberry Cradle Roadside Inn. It had maybe a dozen units in a building that appeared to be in dire need of renovation. This was Dirk's kind of place. A half hour later, Dirk, freshly showered and a little less more rose, pushed open the dirty glass door at the Crawberry Cafe. It's not really a cafe, the owner of this motel had told him. She was so old, she looked in danger of taking her last breath at any second. It's a 50 styles diner. The owner has delusions of grandeur, but it's what all the young folk like you hang out. It's where all the young folk like you hang out. This time of day, there's usually a rush, but the food's worth the wait. Thanks, Dirk said. You're very welcome, young man. The wrinkled, skeletal woman tapped her concave chest. Name's Mo Mode. Is it Mode or Maud? No, it's Mode. <laughs> you need anything? Let me know. Thank you, Mode. Uh, is it Mode? I don't even know. <laughs> I'm really bad with names. I'm sorry. In the 11 days he'd been on his road trip, Dirk had discovered that local diners were his best source of information about old Freddy's locations. In the first town, he tried the country cl clerk's office first, but he'd gotten bogged down in administrative uh, red tape. He'd stumbled onto what he'd needed to know when, dejected, he'd crossed the street to get a burger. Now he knew to go to the burger joints first. The wind attempted to shove Dirk across Crawberry Cafe's lobby before the door fell shut behind him. He stumbled into a seat yourself sign. Its metal stand clattered at its base on the lime green linoleum floor, but he managed to catch it before it fell. He heard a giggle and he flushed, assuming it was directed at his klutziness. <laughs> he didn't turn to check. He just headed for an open spot at the bright red counter rimmed in shining chrome. Even without looking around, Dirk got an instant feel for the place. The smells of grilling meat and onions, the clatter of plates and the chatter of three dozen or so voices filled the diner's interior. A pop hit from two decades ago played on a gleaming jukebox squatting in the lobby. 
The diners he could see at the counter and those in the booths within his peripheral vision appeared to be about his age. Padded, round, swivelling stools sat in front of the counter and Dirk took a seat on an empty one, spinning himself inward to pick up a sticky, laminated menu. Before he'd had more than ten seconds to look at it, a large woman in a tight lime green server uniform slid a glass of ice water across the counter to him. What do you want? She sang in a cheerful voice. Dirk smiled at her and noticed her name was Wendy. Hi, Wendy, he said. Wendy smiled back. When she smiled, she tucked in her double chin, turning it into a triple chin. She was pretty in her bright red lipstick and hooded brown eyes. Dirk dropped his gaze and skimmed the menu quickly. He confirmed what he'd assumed would be there. Double cheeseburger, mayo, no ketchup or mustard, fries, whatever cola you have. You got it! When he gave him a thumbs up, flashing a red painted nail. Dirk felt ridiculously pleased with himself, as if he'd just ordered the perfect thing. As soon as Wendy turned toward the kitchen ahead, Dirk reached to get napkins from the dispenser at the back of the counter. He pulled out four and placed them neatly to the left of his narrow space. Moving in here, or are you a tourist? Someone asked in a nasally voice. Dirk looked to his right. Oh, it's a woman. <laughs> a frizzy-haired woman, maybe a year or two younger than him, sat on the next stool over. I'm not changing the voice. She pushed round-rimmed glasses up on her little bulb-shaped nose. How do you know I don't live here already? He asked. Dirk didn't think everyone would know everyone, even in a town this size. The woman squished up her face. Intuition. I just know things. Dirk raised an eyebrow. Is she some kind of cook? Inwardly, he shrugged. Who cares? She was a local and he needed to talk to a local. Well, you're right, he said. I'm... well, I'm not sure you w what you could call me. I'm not moving here and I'm not a tourist like you probably mean. What do you think I mean? The woman asked. Oh, leave him alone, Agnes, another woman said. This one leaned around Agnes and stared at Dirk with huge blue eyes. She had limp brown hair and a long face dominated by a toothy smile. I'm Dawn. She stuck out a bony hand. Dirk, he said, shaking her hand. I don't shake hands, Agnes said. Oh, sorry. So what are you doing here? Agnes said. <laughs> She's just like a robot. <laughs> what are you doing here? Uh, Wendy set a fizzy cola down in front of Dirk. Its bubbles sprayed above the glass's rim. A red paper straw bobbed above the rim as well. Well, actually, I'm kind of on a hunt. I'm looking for a Freddy Fazbear's pizza. Oh, I remember those places. The pizzeria with the animatronics, right? Dawn said. Dirk turned his stool to look at her more directly. Right, you had one here? Sure. Wait, I forgot. Oh yeah, Ag okay, sorry. Sure, we used to go there when we were kids, remember Agnes? Agnes picked up the milkshake that sat in front of her. She sucked noisily through the straw. Yeah, I didn't like that place. It was creepy. Dawn laughed at her friend. Remember Bonnie? He was my favourite. I thought he was a sh- I, I thought he was a sh- <laughs> Agnes said. Bonnie's not a boy's name. Dawn sighed. Well, Bonnie was a boy rabbit. <laughs> I love how uh, Scott's obviously put this here. <laughs> um, what is Mangle's gender? Yes. Uh, before Agnes could respond to that, Wendy reappeared and put Dirk's plate in front of him. She placed similar plates in front of Agnes and Dawn. She stuck a check under each plate. Thanks, Dirk said. For the next few minutes, the only talk was focused on passing salt, ketchup and extra napkins. Dirk nearly inhaled most of his burger in just a few bites. It was the best one he'd had yet on his trip. The meat was seared just right, perfectly juicy. The cheese was extra sharp and the pickles were tangy. For a few minutes, he forgot his quest and just chowed down, but then he remembered why he was here. He turned toward the woman at the counter next to him. So, do either of you remember where Freddy's was? That place shut down forever ago, Dawn said. I don't even remember what part of town it was in. Maybe out on the west edge? No, that was the other pizza place, she shrugged. Agnes frowned. I think Freddy's was on the north end of town, remember, Dawn? You had to go by that biker's tavern to get to it. The biker's always made me nervous. You must be right, Dawn said. But if it was out here there, it's not there now. Agnes nodded. I don't think there's a building in this town that could have been a Freddy's. 
I've been to a couple Freddy's pizzerias and other places and they had certain look about them. I can't think of an abandoned building here that looks like that. Maybe it got torn down. Dirk's stomach flipped over. But he figured before he got upset, he determined whether the Freddy's in this town was even the one he was looking for. Dirk wiped his mouth and took a big swallow of cola to wash down the food he just shoveled in. I have a question about your Freddy's. Both Agnes and Dawn looked at him. He thought he saw Dawn wink at him. Was she flirting? He didn't know. He'd never been flirted with. Ha, <laughs> relatable. He, <laughs> he cleared his throat. Do either of you remember an animatronic shark? It was Felix, Agnes breathed. <laughs> she hugged herself. I had a crush on Felix when I was young. <laughs> I was a fishmonger's daughter. Uh, she hugged herself. You're talking about Felix. Yes, Dirk shouted, triumphant. For an instant, the buzz of chatter in the diner died down to practically nothing. Dirk felt his face blaze red. Sorry, he mumbled. What are you looking at? Agnes snapped at a blonde woman staring from a nearby booth. The woman rolled her eyes and looked away. I'm sorry, Dirk said to Agnes and Dawn. I got excited. See, I've been looking for Felix. I mean, the Freddies that had Felix. And why? Agnes gasped. Why would you want to find that monster? It was horrible. She looked at... Sorry. She looked at Dawn. Remember him? That terrifying shark thing in the tube? Dawn gave an elaborate shudder. Hmm. <laughs> I do remember it now that you mention it. Wow. I had, I had blocked that out. But yeah, I got in that tube when I was little. Maybe five or six years old. I had nightmares about it for weeks after that. She turned to Agnes. We swam together that day. Agnes took a long, noisy suck from her straw. Then she punched Dirk in the upper arm. Thanks a lot, jerk. D Dirk rubbed his arm and stared at her. What is wrong with this crazy woman? <laughs> That's what I'm wondering. This is a character. I really should not have put on this voice. Agnes rubbed her nose, which had turned red, and she reached under her glasses to wipe her eyes. I never told you. She said to Dawn, but mum actually took me to a therapist a few times because of that horrible shark. I wasn't just having nightmares. I got like sick every time I thought about it. She glared at Dirk. It's been years since I thought about all that and you had to go bring it all up. <laughs> Dirk couldn't figure out what was going on. Was there more than one shark at Freddy's? Felix wasn't horrible. He said so out loud. I liked Felix, he said. I didn't think he was scary. He... It was kind of the sad type, really. Uh, like he, like he, <laughs> he wished he could be out in the restaurant with the others instead of in a tube by himself. <laughs> Sorry, that's that's funny to me. Uh, he loved having kids swim with him. He was friendly. He was an animatronic dude. Dawn said <laughs> he didn't wish anything, and I never thought he seemed sad or friendly. He was actually kind of hungry looking. She gave Agnes a half smile. I totally get why he freaked you out. When that thing swam towards you, it was pretty scary. Agnes pushed her plate away, her burger half eaten. I had nightmares for a long time. Not just about Felix, but about the tank too. I used to dr dream about getting trapped in that tank with him. I remember going around and around and around, trying to scream but not being able to because of the mask. Then I'd wake up, choking. Dirk frowned at Agnes. Are you sure we're talking about the same place? The Felix I remember was in an enclosed tube that circled the whole restaurant. Maybe there was a different Felix than another Freddy's. In a town this size? Two Freddy's? Dawn said. No. We just had the one. And yeah, Felix was in an enclosed tube that went around the whole place. I'm not sure why, but I think your memory of that shark is a little skewed. If you thought he was friendly, you're imagining things. I'm not imagining things, Dirk yelled. Once again, the restaurant went quiet. This time, someone hollered back. Take a pill. Oh, fuck, damn it. <laughs> Take a chill pill, dude. Dirk clenched his fist, and he noticed both Agnes and Dawn were leaning away from him. Fine. He couldn't believe what was happening here. He'd been so elated when Dawn had said she remembered Felix. He'd done it. All his research and his travel had gotten him to where he needed to be. But now it was all going wrong. Why didn't they remember the Felix he remembered? Dirk stood and grabbed his check. 
I think you're both delusional. Felix wasn't a monster, and I'm going to find him. Dirk stomped away from the table, ignoring the looks that were thrown his way. He hurried to the cash register, and barely looked up when Wendy stepped up to take his money. I couldn't help but overhear. Wendy kept her hand on his when he handed her a 20. Dirk lifted his head and met her gaze. About Freddy's, Wendy said. I know something that might help you. Up close, Wendy gave off an odd scent of grease and lavender. Dirk noticed she'd smudged her lipstick. She removed her hand and began making change. Freddy's was condemned after a kid almost drowned in that tube you were talking about. <laughs> Knew it! God, I called it. <laughs> I called it. There was an incident, an incident that uh, condemned Freddy's. Uh, I remember reading about it in the paper. My husband was a contractor and he worked on the building after Freddy's closed down. He claimed that the owner of Freddy's had made a secret deal with a land developer. He sold the land on the condition that the developer's project be built to keep Freddy's intact. It must still be there. Really? Where? The words came out in a high-pitched squeak. Dirk was so excited he was practically bouncing. Wendy grinned at him. The place m matters that much to you, huh? Dirk flushed. Well, it's one of my best childhood memories. Wendy nodded, then leaned over the counter and lowered her voice. Well, I'm sorry. I remember it was out on the west side, like the girl said, but I don't know what was built around it. The town didn't need the bad press, so it was all hush-hush. Forkstop was going crazy then. We had all kinds of things going up. The big mall on the other side of the town, the resort, the theatre, a bunch of restaurants, the water park, all closed down now. So your husband wouldn't know anything? Wendy finished for Dirk. She, looked, she shook her head. I'm sorry, no. He passed several months ago. Oh, I'm really sorry. Thank you. Wendy's eyes glazed a bit, but she continued. I wish I could tell you more. Felix became a sort of local legend around here after Freddy's closed. When the former owner died, there were tons of rumours going around. No way to tell what's true anymore. Rumours? Like what? Oh, crazy stuff. Like that the owner had kept Felix functioning even after Freddy's was closed. That he had some secret project related to that shark. Kids used to go hunting for him, saying the owner had a way of sneaking back into Freddy's to see Felix. Dirk opened his mouth to ask a question, but a man shouted, Wendy, order up! She gave Dirk an apologetic look. That's all I know, sorry. She handed him his change. He gave half of it back to her, then left the diner in a daze. The next morning, Dirk returned to the Crawberry Cradle Roadside Inn's tiny rose wallpaper covered office. You like the wallpaper? Maud asked when she noticed him staring at it. I swear it's Maud. Maud. Look, I'm sorry if I'm getting it wrong. I'm just going to call her Mary. <laughs> Mary asked when she noticed him staring at it. Mary's grey hair had been in a bun the day before. But today it was in a long braid that hung down the back of her green plaid flannel shirt. No, Duck said. Still in a fog. Sorry, I mean, Mary cackled. You're a funny young man. Same wallpaper was in Floyd Crawberry's mama's drawing room. I had made this I had this made special. Well, it's really um red, Doug said. <laughs> Mary let loose another cackle. It is that. Um, I need to stay another night, Doug said. He glanced at his watch. He wanted to pay quickly and then get on with the road. But he planned to drive the forty five miles to the country seat and visit the clerk's office unless you don't happen to know where the old Freddy Fazbear's pizza was, do you? With the animatronics? Mary took his money and paused before opening the register. Dirk had spent the previous evening talking to people around the town, trying to figure out what had been built over Freddy's. He'd gotten about two dozen potential locations from this bit of sleuthing. Join me for some peppermint tea, youngster, Mary said, and I'll have a think about that. Dirk groaned inwardly, but he agreed. If Mary did remember, at least it would save him the cost of gas from driving to the county clerk's office. Mary got him settled at a rickety oak table in a tiny kitchen behind the hotel office. She set a fragile-looking cup and saucer in front of him. 
which he was terrified he'd break, and then set down another plate before him. This one held a large blueberry muffin. Okay, maybe tea wasn't such a bad idea after all. The muffin was good and Mary was entertaining. Used to be a different kind of inn right about where we are now. The restaurant kind. Mary handed him a second muffin. Woman who ran it was the best cook in the state. As the story goes, some fellow who planned to go farther west to set up a homestead uh, got one taste of her chicken fried steak and said to his wife, the fork stops here. He bought a bunch of land, started a farm and founded a town. Are you making that up? Dirk asked. Mary blasted him with her laugh. God's honest truth, young man. Dirk decided to nudge her back toward Freddy's. Over the next half hour, he and Mary went through the 24 potential Freddy's locations from his list. She managed to whittle the list down to nine. She didn't know where Freddy's had been, but she knew for sure where it hadn't been. This meant Dirk still had to go to the country seat, or sorry, county seat, which he did. He spent several hours in the clerk's office. They needed someone to come in and reorganize their records, but at least the time he was there was worth it. Triumphant, Dirk left the country seat, uh, sorry, I keep saying country, county seat, with an address for the defunct Freddy's and for what it, uh, for what was at that location now, the water park Wendy had mentioned. <laughs> Dirk had read about the water park the night before. It was the biggest crawberry themed venture to spring up when the town had decided to use its villain as a tourist attraction. And it was also the most successful for a very short time. Now, the Crawberry Flows water park was, according to an angry letter to the editor writer, a dried up eyesore. Even though it was getting late in the day when Dirk returned to Forkstop, he'd used a map he'd brought from across the old gas station to guide his way to the attraction. Buoyed by anticipation, Dirk was practically dancing in his seat as he drove past boarded up stores padlocked warehouses and vacant locks, uh, lots. The scenery wasn't anything to get excited about, but Dirk was on a high. He was about to find it. He was going to bring back evidence to shove it in, uh, to shove in his friends' pitying, patronizing faces, patronizing faces. Uh, Dirk pulled his car over to a cracked curb and frowned at the sprawl of concrete slides and plastic tubes winding around the property. A couple dozen small buildings loomed over a tall chain link uh, fence. If ever a place looked like a serial killer hangout, or where zombies would shuffle en masse, uh, or where Gordon's stupid android ap apocalypse would begin, it was the Crawberry Flows Water Park. Its entrance was guarded by a huge stone archway designed to look like two gravestones connected by a sculpted shovel, hoe, and pitchfork, apparently three of Floyd's murderous weapons of choice. For all the girls at the diner bashed Felix for being scary, this water park didn't look like anything a child might want to visit. From what Dirk had read, though, the place had been quite popular with kids. Maybe the gravestones and murder weapons looked less threatening in their heyday under bright blue sky summers, before they'd been covered with green mould, black mildew, and various colours of angry graffiti. The same mould, mildew, and graffiti appeared to cover all the park's buildings, as well as the tubes and slides curling idly through the park. Overgrown by scraggly bushes, all the expanses and contraptions that used to hold water now held only dirt, dried leaves, and trash. The park gave off an odour of decay that was so sickly sweet it made Dirk's nose twitch. Not far from the entrance, something metallic made a rhythmic screech and tap, maybe a rusted sign swinging in the breeze. Beneath that sound, Dirk could hear a scratchy scrabbling. He envisioned rats scurrying through the empty tube slides. Dirk really didn't want to go into the abandoned water park. He really didn't, and he wasn't even sure he could get in. The chain link fence was topped with barbed wire. But he'd come this far. If what Wendy had told him was right, Freddy's was hidden somewhere in this water park, and Felix was still there. Dirk had to, uh, uh, sorry, Dirk had to try to find him. 
Sighing, Dirk opened his car door and looked around to see if anyone was watching him. He saw no one, so he closed his car door and walked toward the water park's entrance. The hair on the back of his neck stood up as he did. A few drops of rain spotted the dust-covered sidewalk in front of him. One hit his nose. He looked up at the grey sky, nearly identical to the one that had hung low over the town the previous day. Nearly identical. This one was a little darker, a little more threatening. Dirk quickened his pace. From his research, Dirk had learned that the water park sat on 15 acres. The land was pretty much square-shaped. That meant each side of its perimeter was a little over 250 yards long, about the length of two and a half football fields. Dirk glanced up at the sky again. Not only were the clouds threatening, but what little sunlight that shined through them was clearly sinking toward the horizon. Evening was coming. He didn't relish the idea of exploring the place after dark. Dirk set out at a jog and began circling the outside of the park, running alongside the chain link fence. As he ran, he divided his gaze between his feet, not wanting to stumble over anything, and the fence. He was searching for a way through or under it. He figured there had to be some way in. How else did all that graffiti show up on the tubes and slides and buildings? And his suspicions proved right. He found his way in along the back fence. Water runoff had created a depression in the earth under, the, under one section. And there was a, a trough... Yeah, trough... Uh, deep enough for someone's Dirk, so for, eh, for someone Dirk's size to slither through. When he spotted it, he didn't hesitate. He immediately dropped to his belly and crawled under the fence. As soon as Dirk stood up inside the park, thunder rumbled. The air now smelled like ozone, <laughs> and the few drops he'd felt began turning into a steady rain. Great. Dirk had come prepared, sort of, for this excursion. His preparation consisted of his flashlight and an old map of the water park he'd found along with the map of the town. Dirk scanned his surroundings to find a place to shelter while he decided where to start. He spotted a covered picnic area and jogged over to it, ducking under its crumbling roof. The rain pattered just outside the overhang as he grabbed his flashlight and the map. The Crawberry Flows Water Park had three twisting enclosed tube slides, one tall straight open slide, two meandering channels that had been rivers with various levels of rapids, a couple of pools, the smaller one was Floyd's Pond and the larger one was Floyd's Swimming Hole, and one, <laughs> and one beach, a big wave pool, painted to look like the ocean and sand. It also had multiple eating and gathering areas, some covered and some not. The one Dirk was using for protection from the rain was called Floyd's Fury. Obviously, Freddy's wasn't disguised by any of the water features or the eating areas. It also wasn't in the hut-like buildings that had housed snack shops, uh, little gift shops and restrooms. It couldn't have been in the pump house, which was the size of a single car garage. And it couldn't have been in either of the two maintenance buildings, which were about the size of a triple car garage. Freddy's would have been too big to be camouflaged by these smaller components of the park. But four of the park's buildings were possible candidates. These included a guest services building, one large building that housed the park's group of indoor slides, and two restaurants, a grill and a cafe. Dirk thought this relatively small selection of possibilities made his quest doable, and so, map in hand, he pulled up his jacket uh, over his head to keep at least some of the rain off and set off to explore with the assumption he'd be successful in a relatively short amount of time. Dirk's ex assumption was incorrect, horribly so. Three af hours after he'd entered the park, he returned to his room defeated and dejected and cold. Not sure what else to do, he took a long hot shower. In the shower, he assessed his situation, which was at the moment bleak. Dirk had scoured, yeah, every inch of the water park. At first, he'd been full of energy and he'd been thrilled when he'd easily been able to break into the first building that might have hidden Freddy's, the guest services building. His spirits had dipped a little when he didn't find Freddy's in that building, but he was still hopeful. He remained hopeful as he managed to get into both restaurants. When those proved to be lost causes, he moved on, a little less hopeful, to the building that had the indoor slides. That building was harder to enter. He'd actually had to break glass to get in, something he felt bad about. But he'd come too far not to do it. 
However, this one bad deed had been a wasted one. As soon as Dirk was in the building, it was clear it didn't hold Freddy's. Aside from disturbing shadows and dripping and tapping sounds that made all the hairs on Dirk's body stand up, the building held nothing but a tangle of snake-like plastic tubes. The murky exterior of the slides pushed Dirk's overactive imagination just a little too far. He'd come up with dozens of ideas about what might have been hiding in those tubes. Unfortunately, Freddy's wasn't one of those ideas. Losing hope, Dirk had made his way back toward the dip under the fence. By then, he was soaked through, but he still shined his light this way and that in case he'd missed something. The only thing he'd noticed on his return trip was the heavy-duty deadbolt locks on the, all the small buildings. For some reason, they were all more secure than the large buildings he'd gotten into. But it didn't matter. What he wanted wasn't in those buildings anyway. After his shower, Dirk fell into bed. He was asleep in seconds, but his sleep was restless. All night, he was in a dream in which Felix stared at him through a glass wall and begged Dirk to keep uh, to find him and keep him company. Oh, I like that. When he'd gotten up to pee during the night, his inner vision taken up by Felix's longing gaze, Dirk realised he had one more avenue to pursue. When he'd been at the clerk's office, he'd gotten the name of the person who'd owned the Freddy's in Forkstop. Yes, the owner was dead, but perhaps the owner's uh, heirs would know if Freddy's was somewhere inside the water park and if they did maybe they'd have a way to access the building or maybe they could point Dirk to someone who could. A reasonable person probably would have concluded by now that Felix and his swimming tube were a lost cause but luckily Dirk wasn't reasonable and he wasn't ready to stop his search. When Dirk got up in the morning he returned to Mary's office and told her that he needed to stay another night. You got it young man! Mary turned to her computer and began tapping slowly at the keyboard and changing her name. Staring at her, bo <laughs> staring at her bony, age-spotted hands, it occurred to Dirk that Mary had the most knowledge of anyone he'd met in town. She might be able to help him track down the heirs he was after. Did you know an Aaron Sanders? Dirk asked. Mary made a little tsks sound as he shit... Uh, <laughs> I did not mean to swear though, I'm sorry. As he, as she hit. <laughs> oh god. Uh, as she hit the wrong key on her keyboard, Dirk winced. Sorry. Mary shook her head. No matter. I can fix it. She turned and cocked her head. Aaron Sanders, you say? Now there's a name I haven't thought of in years. She sank down onto the stool behind the counter. You knew him? Dirk heard the excited squeak in his voice, but he didn't care. Sure enough, Mary said. I knew him when we were kids. He was kind of a strange boy, always playing pranks, making up stories and making puzzles or mazes. He once spent the whole summer digging deep trenches on his parents' property, creating mazes. Mary shook her head. I didn't know an Aaron as an adult. Uh, but no one really did after the tragedy. What tragedy? Mary sighed. It was so sad. She took a deep breath and blew it out. Her breath smelled like mouthwash. It all started so well for Aaron. That's what makes it so sad. The promise he had, you know? Dirk didn't respond because he didn't. No, he just waited. Aaron married this lovely girl right out of high school. Then he just started to take the world by its tail. Studied restaurant management. Had his own little hole-in-the-wall sandwich place by the time he was 20. Also had a son by then, too. Sweet little baby boy, Lonnie. M Mary uh, stopped talking and looked beyond Dirk's shoulder. Dirk waited some more. Mary blinked and shook herself. Right about the time Aaron was looking in to getting the Freddy's franchise. He took his wife and children to the coast for a vacation. By then, he had a daughter too. Now, I only know this story from newspaper articles and town gossip, so take it with a grain of salt. I know exactly what's coming. But if the story's true, Lonnie was chasing a butterfly near the edge of the surf, and before Aaron or his wife could stop him, Lonnie chased the butterfly right into the water. Got caught in the surf and drowned. That's terrible, Dirk said. More, uh, Maud nodded. Sure enough, it is. But then it gets strange. According to Aaron, Lonnie's body would have been pulled out to sea. P 
possibly never found, but a shark swam close to shore and bumped the body back into the shallow waters where Aaron was able to recover it. Okay, that actually wasn't what I thought this was going to be, but I'm remembering the leaks now. Dirk's eyes widened. Wow. Yeah, most people don't believe that part of the story, but I tend to. It sure would explain his antics with the pizzeria. What do you mean? Oh, the controversy about him wanting to have an animatronic shark at Freddy's. Dirk leaned forward. Felix, he said. Mary raised an eyebrow at him. That's right, Felix the shark. The other Freddy's pizzerias didn't have a shark, so people said Felix would make Aaron's Freddy's inauthentic. He didn't care. He came back from that vacation as a totally different person. His wife, too. Which was understandable, of course. She just shut down, withdrew from the world. Aaron, though, he pushed harder in his business. But he was obsessed. Obsessed with sharks and butterflies. She shook her head. He was an odd duck, but then he had good reason to be. Dirk nodded. Mary rubbed her eyes and returned her attention to the computer keyboard. Dirk cleared his throat. Do you know who inherited his estate? Is his wife still alive? Mary raised her head and shook it. No, she died not long after Lonnie di uh, did. Only Louisa is left, Aaron's daughter. Mary adjusted the old-fashioned combs that held back her grey hair today. Do you know where she is? Well, that's an even sadder story there. Dirk sighed. Now what? What happened to her? He asked. Oh, poor Louisa. She's a ward of the state now. Spends her days locked in her mind. She's completely gone from this world. Completely? She wouldn't remember what happened to Freddy's. Mary shook her head. Louisa's last lucid thoughts went into that book, she wrote. What book? Mary looked up at the ceiling. What was the title? It was sort of a cult hit a, f a few years back. Louisa wrote it right after her father died, dedicated it to him. Folks said that she actually wrote it because she he asked her to. Sorry, I'm messing up. <laughs> and for some reason, no one can explain. Right after that, she just faded away. Some say it was just a matter of time. She was only a baby when Lonnie died, but having bereft, bereft parents can scar a child. Mary tapped the counter with a gnarled finger. I can never remember the name of that book, but I have a copy. Most folks in Forkstop do. Her joints creaking audibly, Mary heaved herself from the stool and disappeared into her private domain. Dirk could hear her shuffling around and muttering, let's see, let's see, yep, here it is. Mary returned with a trade paperback book. She set it on the counter so Dirk could see the cover image of a prehistoric looking cross between a shark and a crocodile. Dirk gasped, grabbing the paperback. That's the dogged dogmatist. I love this book. He stared at it in awe. He couldn't believe it. He looked at Mary who was grinning at his excitement. I made up a game based on this book, Caverns and Crocodiles. Aaron Sanders' daughter wrote it, but it says Louisa Jewell. Dirk tapped the author's name. Jewel is her middle name, Mary said. Dirk stared at the cover of the book again, then looked up at M Mary. <laughs> Maud. Uh, it is Maud. I, 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 I'm pretty sure it's Maud. I'm going to keep saying Maud so that you guys don't get annoyed. Oh, you're probably already annoyed. I don't even care. This is like the last few times I'm going to have to say it anyway, so I have to talk to her. Maud studied him for a minute, then nodded. I'll make a call. See if we can get you in with the little fib. They might let you in to see her, but don't expect much. Dirk wasn't very good at controlling his expectations, so he didn't even bother to try before he entered Matson State Hospital. Even setting aside how close he was to unravelling the mystery of Felix, he was about to meet one of his favourite authors. Ever since he discovered Louisa wrote The Dogged Dogmatist, Dirk had been reviewing what he remembered about the book. Maud had loaned him a, her copy of the book, but he hadn't opened it yet. He didn't need to, he knew the book well. The novel had come out when Dirk had turned 15 and it had immediately grown 
uh, sorry, gotten a huge following, most of which consisted of people like Dirk, people who didn't fit in, who wanted to see layers when others wanted to accept things at face value. The novel was the story of a man whose determination to be right proved to be his undoing. Possibly, anyway. The ending was obscure, and people debated whether the man lived or died at the end. Dirk and Leo had discussed this ad nauseum. Leo was sure the man died. Dirk believed he lived. The whole book was obscure, actually. The gist of the story was a man on a quest to find the prehistoric shark-croc hybrid depicted on the book's cover. Oh, there you go then. <laughs> the man was led on his quest by a voice of intuition he heard in his head. The man's search for the creature was convoluted on the whole, but certain lines in the book went beyond convoluted. They just didn't make sense. Neither did the drawing in the middle of the book, an ornate and frilly sketch of what looked like butterflies and flowers. Butterflies and flowers! <laughs> the drawing was never referred to in the book, and it couldn't be related to any of the story. I wonder what that has a connection to. Maybe the other thing about butterflies in this story. <laughs> Were the odd lines and drawing uh, some kind of code? For what purpose? Now that he'd been in the water park, though, Dirk knew thought he knew what they were for. It was starting to make sense, if he was right. Inside Matson State Hospital, Dirk followed a red-headed caregiver a, a, down a long beige corridor. She looked to be about Dirk's age, but she was taller and very serious. After the caregiver made a left turn, she stopped in front of the second door on that hallway. She's in there, the girl said, pointing. So kind of you to visit your cousin. People don't come in often enough. Then she turned and walked back down the hall, her crepe soled shoes making funny, spongy sounds as she went. Dirk flushed at the lie. So, I broke a window and told a white lie, he said to himself. People have done worse for less. Dirk stepped into a small yellowish room that contained one hospital bed, two visitors' chairs, a recliner, a bureau, a nightstand and a TV on a shelf on the wall. The light in the room was dim and the space smelled like honey, vinegar and bleach, an odd combination. He looked at the bed's occupant. Louisa Jewel Sanders didn't look as vacant as Maud had said she was. In fact, she seemed alert. Her gaze was focused directly on Dirk. A fragile-looking petite blonde woman, Louisa appeared to be in her early 40s maybe. She had small features, pale blue eyes, thin lips and almost translucent skin. Dirk had asked Maud what was wrong with Louisa and she just shrugged. Some kind of past trauma is, th is the story. She's perfectly healthy, but she can't speak or function on her own. She just sits or lies in her bed and stares. Hi Louisa, Dirk said, slipping into the room and walking softly to a visitor's chair. He hesitated, then sat a few feet from Louisa's bed. Louisa didn't say anything, but her eyes shifted to stay on him. Louisa was dressed in a simple moss green smock dress and white socks. The, the neck of the dress was scooped and he could see she wore a necklace with a butterfly pendant. Wow! <laughs> Sorry, I'm going to stop doing that. He gestured at it. That's a cool pendant, a zebra long winged butterfly. I like those. Louisa might have been silent, but she wasn't out of it. When Dirk finished talking... She touched the butterfly's black and pale yellow striped wi wide wings. Dirk felt a jitter of excitement skitter through his body. He smiled at Louisa. I've always loved butterflies. Louisa didn't move. Dirk wasn't sure how to begin, so he just jumped in. I have a lot of good memories from my time in your dad's restaurant, Freddy's. We weren't in the town a long time, but I went to Freddy's every day while we were here. I liked visiting Felix. Do... He stopped. He was going to ask if she remembered Felix, but he didn't want to make her upset. Everyone else in Forkstop seemed to hate Felix. He talked to a few more people since he'd been with Agnes and Dawn in the diner, and they all had memories similar to those of the two women. I want to find Felix, Dirk said softly. I was hoping you could tell me if the Freddy's your dad owned is still, um, around. Dirk noticed a vein in Louisa's neck was starting to pulse quickly. He stopped talking and hurried to change the subject, pulling her novel out of his jacket pocket. I love your book, he said. Louisa looked at the book, then looked back at Dirk. Dirk waited, not sure what to say next. Before he could decide, Louisa moved, and Dirk jumped in his seat. Louisa tilted her head slightly and reached up to unclasp the chain around her neck. 
Removing the butterfly from the chain, she held out her hand to Dirk. No, I can't take that, he protested. She held his gaze. He shrugged, leaned forward and stretched out his hand. She dropped the pendant into his palm. What's this for? Dirk asked. Louisa looked away from the book Dirk held to him and back at the book again. Dirk followed her gaze and he smiled. He thought he knew what she was trying to tell him, maybe. He opened his mouth to ask a question, but Louisa closed her eyes. She was done with him. Dirk watched her for a few seconds, then nodded. He'd gotten what he needed. He was sure of it. Thanks, Louisa, Dirk said. He got up, tucked the pendant in his pocket, left the room, strode out to his car, and drove back to his motel. In his room, sitting on his sagging queen-size bed and looking at the plush Felix, which swam on the scarred oak nightstand, he called Leo. Dirk, Leo said when he answered the phone. Everyone's been talking about you. I doubt that. Dirk said. Well, we have. Dirk knew we were his friends. Jenny says it's our fault you left. Gordon says you're too determined for your own good. Wyatt wants to go looking for you. He even started researching Freddy's locations. Tell him to stop. I found it. Or at least I think I did. Really? It's real? Send pictures. Well, it's... yeah. I'll send pictures. Dirk didn't feel like going into the whole water park thing. Listen, I'll... I called because I have a question. Do you remember that list of pointless clues we made from the dogged dogmatist? The ones you thought were code? Sure. I don't have my copy of the book with me. I have a copy, but not the one I marked up. I think I remember the clues, but I don't want to take the time to go through the whole book. And I want to be sure that I'm right. Do you have yours? Dirk heard a creaking sound, and he knew Leo was sitting in his rolling chair at the drafting table. The sound of rustling papers followed a couple of thuds. Leo kept filing cabinets full of scribbled ideas and apparently he had a system that worked for him. He could always dig up what he was looking for. The rustling stopped. For a few seconds, Dirk waited. Got it. You remember the weird drawing, right? Yes, I looked at that in the copy I have here. Cool, want me to read the other four things to you? Leo asked. Yes, please. Leo read off the items while Dirk wrote as fast as he could. What are you up to? Leo asked. What's the novel got to do with Freddy's and the shark? I'm not 100% sure yet. I'll let you know. Where are you? Leo asked. I'll let you know when I figure this all out. Dirk said goodbye to Leo and told him to tell the others, especially Jenny. He wasn't angry anymore. He read over the short list Leo had given him and looked at his watch. He barely had an hour if he was going to get to where he needed to go in time. He stood and left his motel room. Instead of parking on the road as he had the first time he visited the derelict water park, this time Dirk drove around to the back of the park. He left his car near as... Uh, sorry, he left his car near the truff... Tr truff... I swear I said that word before correctly. He left his car near the truff that led under the fence. As he had the night before, Dirk came prepared, which hadn't taken much effort. His pockets held just his flashlight and the list he'd made when he talked to Leo. Dirk crawled under the fence again. Although it wasn't raining, he trotted over to the sheltered eating area to stop and think a minute. He perched on the edge of a cold, hard metal bench and looked out at the moss-covered structures pressing in around him. The sky held only a few clouds today, but here in the water park the day still felt dingy and dark probably because of the overgrown vegetation. Dirk had hoped he'd be more comfortable in the park during the day, but the place still gave him the heebie-jeebies. He took a deep breath and forced himself to focus. The dogged dogmatists' the strange clues were the subject of endless analysis by the book's fans. Countless theories about them had been put forth. Dirk and Leo and Wyatt had come up with at least a couple dozen on their own. None of the theories had made sense until Dirk had started thinking about them in the context of the water park. The entirety of the novel takes place in a desert area, dry and rocky and utterly devoid of water. In spite of this, however, the main character receives two clues that are related to water. The first one directs him to a, a swimming hole, which doesn't exist, and the second one tells him to follow the flow of water, which also doesn't exist. The character blithely ignores the clues making them seem even more out of place. Was it called Chekhov's gun? Where, like, if something is mentioned in a story, it's 
it, it like it has to be it has to be you like useful like it has to be used later on in the story right it has to come back up otherwise what's the point of them mentioning it it's just kind of like wasting wasting words in a book wasting time it's like Chekhov's gone or something um the character blithely ignores the clues making them seem even more out of place and he ignores two others as well the third clue the character ignores comes in a dream in which a wise woman tells him the butterfly reveals the key no butterfly of any kind shows up in the book the last clue the character ignores is the direction from his inner voice to be there at 333 because the character never goes anywhere at that hour, Dirk and other readers thought 333 was some kind of numerology clue. However, now he thought it was exactly what it seemed to be, a time of day. And that was why Dirk had hurried over here. He glanced at his watch. It was 3.18pm. He didn't have much time. Dirk, of course, knew that 3.33 could be a.m. instead of p.m., but p.m. was coming first, so he figured he might as well make the assumption that p.m. was correct. If he was wrong, he might come back during the night. A rustling in the bushes at the edge of the picnic area abruptly plucked Dirk from his mental planning. He scanned the dense foliage encroaching on the shelter. When he spotted a pair of yellow orbs, he gasped, but then the orbs disappeared, and he realised they'd been small. He'd probably just spooked an opossum or maybe a squirrel. Dirk stood. See, if that doesn't come back up in the story, this is definitely like a Chekhov's gun situation where, like, that has to be something. That must be, like, spoilers for the epilogues. That must be, like, Eleanor or something, <laughs> you know, right? Um, if the pointless clues in the novel were directions for finding Freddy's, Dirk needed to get to Floyd's swimming hole, which wasn't far from the sheltered picnic area. Thankfully, Dirk had gotten quite enough of poking around the spooky water park the night before. The Crawberry Flows water park might have been in a semi-urban setting. The intermittent shush and vroom of passing cars was a reminder of that, but it was being reclaimed by rural wildlife and vegetation. The night before, once the sun had gone down, Dirk had been ser serenaded by crickets and frogs, and he'd jumped at the continual sounds of small animals moving in the bushes. Twice he'd been startled by owl hoots, this afternoon, the crickets were silent, but the frogs still had a lot to say. As soon as Dirk started down the narrow path that wound back toward the pool, he heard another sound, a distant howl. That made him freeze. It sounded like a coyote. Could a coyote get through the fence? Dirk picked up his pace. If his theory was right, he was going to find a way to get underground. The prospect of being in the dark tunnels he expected to find wasn't incredibly uplifting, but at least he wouldn't have to deal with wild animals in tunnels, hopefully. Passing a loading area for the river rapids on one side and a small supply of shed on the other, Dirk's feet crunched over gravel and twigs as he hurried around a corner and aimed toward the massive swimming pool he'd ignored the night before. Another howl echoed throughout the park and the breeze picked up, swishing tree branches and bushes. Dirk moved even faster. After just two more turns and a fight with the low-hanging branch of a, mo of a maple tree, Dirk arrived at the edge of a huge, empty swimming pool. He looked down into it, but he saw nothing except dirt and dry leaves, and the edge of what was probably a painted design on the tiles at the bottom of the pool. The design was barely visible. Most of it was covered by dirt. The breeze was picking up the leaves and swirling them around. Now what? Dirk looked at his watch. It was 3.24. He had just nine minutes to wait. Dirk started walking around the periphery, of the pool to pass time, frowning in concentration as he gazed at every little detail of the area. He found a quarter by the broken down diving board, but his investigation didn't turn up anything else. He checked the time, just one more minute. Looking around the area again, Dirk rolled his shoulders to release the tension. He didn't have any idea what to expect at 3.33, which made him feel like he was about to walk into something that was very more, that was more likely than a trap. Um, Every muscle in his body was taut. He pulled out his flashlight to use a weapon, uh, to use as a weapon if needed. Dirk watched the seconds tick past, and at 3.33 exactly, he raised his flashlight overhead like a club and widened his stance. He listened intently, swiveled his head this way and that. Nothing happened. Maybe it's something like a sundial. You know those, yeah? <laughs> like the, when the sun's in like the right place in the sky, it'll make like a 
shadow or something, and then it would be like a secret code. I don't know. <laughs> uh, Dirk turned in a complete circle. He stared at everything around him. He felt like he was in the middle of one of those games where you had to spot what was out of place in the picture. Something must have happened at 3.33, but what? You couldn't see any differences in his surroundings. Dirk squinted at the idea around him for several more minutes, and then, when the sun shone in his eyes, he moved in to the shadow thrown from the nearby water slide. Wait a second. Shade! Shadow! Dirk stepped back out of the shade and stared at the shadow. He smiled. I called it! The shadow was vaguely arrow-shaved! <laughs> Could it be? Dirk had seen something like this in treasure hunt movies where clues were often hidden in plain sight. Was it really so hard to believe this sort of thing happened in real life? Dirk looked at the end of the pool designated by the shadow arrow. The arrow seemed to be pointing to right under the sagging diving board. Dirk looked down at the bottom of the pool where the arrow nearly touched the tile. He couldn't see anything. He glanced at the ladder leading down into the pool. It was rust encrusted and he didn't think he wanted to see if it would hold its weight. He turned and trotted to the shallow end of the pool. Walking down into the pool, he headed to the spot where the point of the shadow ended. There, he knelt and scraped away several layers of dirt and sediment. He found nothing. Frowning, Dur Dirk sat back on his heels. Was he in the wrong place? He didn't think so. Was he missing something? He looked up at the water slide and passed the top of it to the sun. He gasped and snapped his fingers. The sun! The sun wasn't always in the same place in the sky at a given time of day everywhere in the world, obviously. If 333 was related to a cast shadow, the timing would have to be precise for a particular location and time and date. If 333 was right for the time and place in the book, it might not be right for this date. Dirk grinned at his cleverness. Then he stopped grinning. What good would his cleverness do? He had no idea how to calculate the right date for this place and time. What now? Dirk sat down in the dirt under the diving board. He stared at the end of the shallow arrow. He blinked and leaned forward. The arrow had been had retracted from where it had been. As the sun moved, the shadow arrow was being pulled toward the middle of the pool. Dirk got back on his knees and he began digging the dirt away from the line cast by the shaft part of the shadow arrow. Of course, what he was doing was about as imprecise as you could get. Maybe at the right time of day, the arrow wouldn't even land in the pool, but he didn't think so. The fact that a swimming hole was one of the pointless clues in the book convinced him he was in the right place, so he kept digging. He dug until he got to the edge of the design he'd noticed on the tiles. His heart rate doubled. A design could be a clue. Why hadn't he looked there to start with? Dirk leaned forward and dug faster around the edge of the design. As soon as he'd moved just a few inches of caked crud, he realised he was on the right track. Part of the design was a zebra, long-wing butterfly. Panting in his eagerness, Dirk poured and scraped at the dirt until he'd revealed the whole design. He whooped. <laughs> whoop whoop! This is the place! The design on the bottom of the pool was a perfect match to the strange ornate drawing in the dogged dogmatist. Dirk grinned at the design. For several minutes, he ran his fingers over the whole design, searching for some kind of hidden handle or something. Nothing! He pulled out the list of clues he'd scribbled down and looked at it. Get to the ending! <laughs> the flow of water. Next must be the flow of water. He looked at the design again. Maybe this... Actually, I think I said this in my summary video. Um, I think this is probably the reason it was scrapped. It was just really long-winded. Like, there's so much, so many details here that, like, don't need to be here. Just get to the point. We understand the whole butterfly thing. We understand the whole dogged dogmatist thing. Get through the clues and get to the ending. <laughs> um, or at least that's how I feel. I don't know. It's, it's all right. It's, it's good tension, I guess. Next must be the flow of water. He looked at the design again. Could water flow from here? Maybe at one time, but... Feeling like an idiot, Dirk lay down on the ground and put his ear against the decorated tiles. If water was any place near here, it had to be under the pool. Maybe he'd hear it. Stilling his breath, he listened and he smiled. He could hear the faint sound of running water, but how to get to it? Dirk pushed up to a sitting position and looked around the bottom of the pool. <clears throat> Uh, was there a trapdoor or something he could go through? 
He knelt and started pouring at the dirt again. He brushed it further and further back from the middle of the pool, but he didn't find anything. Shifting to his butt again, he frowned. How could he follow the water? Dirk rubbed a filthy hand over his sweaty face and studied the pool again. He couldn't see anything that suggested a way to follow the water. Changing positions, he looked at the drain in the middle of the pool floor. It was only 8 inches or so in diameter, not nearly big enough for a person to fit through. Dirk crawled through the drain. Something about it looked weird, like it was asymmetrical or something. Had it been installed wrong, it looked thicker on one side than the other. Dirk reached the drain and ran his hand over it. Maybe there was a latch or something that would reveal a trapdoor under the drain or... Wait a second. Dirk changed positions and hunched over the drain. He pressed his fingers hard against the metal, su on, the metal on one side. Was he imagining things? No, he didn't think so. He used his now filthy fingernails to scrape out more dirt, he grinned. He wasn't imagining things. There was a depression in the metal at the one side of the drain. A depression shaped exactly like the pendant in Dirk's pocket. Wow! I'm so amused. Uh, Dirk... <laughs> I'm, cap I'm captivated. Dirk's breath came in eager gasps as he jabbed his fingers into his jeans pocket. He pulled out the pendant and holding his breath, he pressed it into the depression in the, br in the drain. At first, nothing happened. He pressed the pendant down more firmly. He was rewarded with a loud metallic click and part of the drain lifted upward. Dirk leaned over and peered into the tiny metal compartment that was revealed. Yes, he shouted. He was looking at a key. Oh my god, my voice is going to go soon. <laughs> With shaking fingers, Dirk reached into the compartment and pulled out an ordinary looking key. As soon as he did, the compartment snapped closed and the pen popped free. Dirk stared at the key in his hand. The butterfly revealed the key. How cool was this? He was in his own real life treasure hunt. The key had uh, to open a building that would lead him to the flow of water, but which building? Dirk picked up the pendant and returned it to his pocket. Then he held a key, feeling its grooves for a minute while he thought. Abruptly, Dirk jumped up and brushed himself off. Idiot! Where would you go if you wanted to follow a flow of water? The pump house! Dirk ran the length of the bottom of the pool and up the slope of the shallow end as fast as he could. At the edge of the pool, he stopped for a second to get his bearings. Then he turned down a path to the left of the pool, and he ran toward the pump house as fast as he could. I hope you guys kind of feel the same way as me. I'm sorry if you don't. But, like, it does feel kind of, like, long-winded. Uh, especially when, it, it like, this story had such a cool intro, and it's really, like, mysterious at the beginning and stuff. Like, oh, there's this whole, like, mystery of this guy who, you know, his son died, the shark pulled him back up or whatever, uh, then there's this daughter, blah, 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 dog a dogmatist. Like, it all seems really cool, and then it gets to this part, and it's just like, oh, wow, this is this, oh, wow, this is this! It's just, watching someone figure something out in a book isn't that interesting, I don't think, I don't know. It, it just seems really, like, obvious, like, this is what you do. Just as he knew it would, the key he'd found fit the pump house deadbolt lock. It took a couple of tries to get it to turn. His fingers sweaty from his run and his excitement kept slipping off the key, but it did turn and the door to the pump house opened. Dirk pulled out his flashlight and stepped into the murky space, crammed full of dirty metal pipes. He turned on his, flash, his flashlight and closed the door behind him. Then he stood, still to quiet his breathing. He listened. Here we go. After just a few seconds, he took a couple of steps and felt one of the bulging pipes. It was cool. He put his ear to it. He smiled. A flow of water was moving through the pipe. Dirk looked down at the key he still held. If he hadn't found it, there was no way he'd have been able to get in this building. Good thing he was good at clues and puzzles. Now all he had to do was follow the sound of water. Dirk shined his light at the bottom of the pipe and he saw that it and all the other pipes in the room dropped down through the pump house floor. He played his light back and forth over the dusty concrete. There had to be a way for maintenance workers to get down to the pipes. He spotted an opening that held a metal ladder bolted to its concrete sides. Dirk aimed his light down the opening and saw that the ladder disappeared in the oi into oily darkness. The pipes must run through tunnels below the park. Taking a deep breath and praying the ladder would hold, he descended. 
When he hit ground again, he found himself in a labyrinth of pipe-filled tunnels. Again, he was quiet until he identified the pipe that had water flowing through it. Then, putting one hand on the pipe and clutching his flashlight with the other, he began following the pipe through the blackness. Oh. <laughs> the flowing water took Dirk on what felt like the longest walk of his life. With just the narrow beam of his light to see and just the faint sound of the water and his hand on the pipe to guide him, it seemed like he journeyed for an eternity through a twisting and turning tangle of concrete and metal. It was a journey that tested his nerve as he never had before. There was a sharp terror to, at the edge of every sight and sound, terror that he wasn't the only one in the tunnels and at the same time terror that he was the only one in the tunnels and would never be found if he somehow got lost. Dirk's expiration um, took more courage than he thought he had. Without that flow of water there was no way out of this complex maze of pipes and he couldn't be sure the water would keep flowing. More than a half a dozen times he thought about turning back and giving up. But Dirk wasn't a quitter and he was sure he was on the right track. The very fact that this serpentine trail of pipes existed told him he understood the clues. Aaron Sanders liked maze mazes and this was a maze. As long as Dirk could hear the water, he knew it would lead him to the destination he sought. And he was right. Just when Dirk's legs were turning to rubber and his nerve was diminishing to the point of non-existence, the pipe he was following ascended up through the opening in the concrete ceiling above him, and next to it was another metal ladder. Dirk didn't hesitate, he quickly climbed the ladder. He found himself in what looked like one of the maintenance buildings he'd dismissed on the first night of exploring. Oh no, how could Freddy's fit in here? He felt so let down that his legs nearly gave out. Had he been wrong? Aiming his light in a circle around him, Dirk caught his breath when the beam landed on the front door of Freddy Fazbear's Pizza. Not just any Freddy's. THE Freddy's. He hadn't been wrong. Dirk waved his light back and forth on either side of Freddy's door, and he could see the moat-like glass enclosure going both ways. He'd found Felix's swimming tube. Who's the man? Dirk shouted. Thankfully, nobody answered him. What? <laughs> Dirk's legs re-energized and he leaped in joy. He did a little sort of dance of triumph. He'd done it. He stopped and frowned. The water looked murky, a kind of greenish brown, which made sense. The water probably hadn't been treated in a decade, but it was moving. Dirk could see variations in the dirt that suggested a flowing current. He looked for Felix and didn't see him, so he walked over to Freddy's double doors. Grabbing the handles, he pulled and the doors fell back. Yes! Stop saying yes! <laughs> Dirk shouted. His voice echoed down the hall and he followed the sound, grinning. The wooden floors were warped and mushy with age, so Dirk was careful to keep his flashlight aimed downward and his gaze on his feet. If he broke a leg, he wasn't sure how he'd get back out. Dirk watched his footsteps scuff aside dust that had, that had to have been uh, accumulating for at least ten years. No one had been down here in a long time, probably since Aaron Sanders had died. Dirk could feel his pulse accelerating with every step he took. He couldn't feel if that was from excitement or anxiety, or maybe both. When he reached the bottom of the stairs that led to the main lobby, Dirk looked at the swim tube. Again, he tried to spy Felix. He didn't see the shark, but that was okay. The encircling tube was big. Felix could have been surfing some other part of it. Dirk took the black checkered stairs two at a time, leaving footprints in the dust as he went. He couldn't believe he was so close to his goal. In the lobby, Dirk's flashlight cast creepy shadows across walls painted with murals, featuring Freddy, Chica and Bonnie. Dirk paused and turned in a circle, thinking about the man whose pain had led to creating this place, creating Felix. Dirk had thought about it and he was sure Felix was a memorial for Lonnie. That was why Aaron had loved this place so much he'd sacrificed his remaining money to get it hidden and have the pipe maze built. Oh, Dirk could understand that kind of grief and obsession. He thought he would have liked Aaron Sanders. He was sorry he didn't get to meet him. Guess what, he was a murderer. <laughs> I'm joking, probably not. Uh, Dirk shook his head. Aaron Sanders didn't matter now. What mattered was that Dirk had known this Freddy's existed, and he was right. He felt the thrill of vindication, and of his quest nearing its completion. He wasn't sure he'd ever stop riding this high. 
Dirk continued on through the lobby, expecting to end up in the dining room. He stopped. The dining room wasn't there. Dirk frowned and shined his light around him. This was definitely Freddy's, but it wasn't the whole pizzeria. No wonder Freddy's could fit in the maintenance building. The only parts of Freddy's that was here, besides Freddy, uh, Felix's swim tube, Freddy's swim tube, were the entrance, the lobby, and a portion of the old arcade. Dirk flashed his light into the gloom, filled with dusty games. Goosebumps sprang up on his arms as the flashlight beam reflected off the metal and plastic surfaces. The old machines looked like frozen giants waiting to be thawed out and reanimated. Dirk shook his head and redirected his light toward the back of the arcade. The stairs leading up to the swimming tube hatch should be there. Oh my gosh, my voice is going. As Dirk followed his flashlight's glow, he heard a humming sound that grew louder as he got closer to the tube's entrance hatch. That had to be the water pump, still chugging along, still coursing water through Felix's domain. And there, he spotted the stairs leading up to the hatch on top of the swimming tube. As soon as Dirk saw the hatch, he began to strip off his jacket. He dropped it and his flashlight to the ground, and he pulled off his shirt. Goosebumps immediately sprouted on his arms. It was cold in here. He hoped the water was as warm as he remembered it. He frowned, worried that he, the water might be cold. Should he check the heat pump? He cocked his head and listened to the humming. Now that he was here again, Dirk remembered the sounds from his past. A kind of layered rumbling. One hum. The water pump. A bit more bass than the other. The heat pump. Yes, there it was. Good. The water would be warm. Dirk rubbed his arms and grinned. He climbed the stairs and touched the cool surface of the circular handle on the hatch. The handle was called a dog, he remembered now. How could he have forgotten that? Why is that a detail I need to know? <laughs> He hadn't forgotten Felix, though. He hadn't misremembered or made it up. He'd been sure this swim tube existed, and it did. He also knew Felix was in there, and he was about to prove that he was right about that, too. Not that anyone was in here to see that he was right, but that didn't matter. He would confirm he was right, and he'd have the satisfaction of knowing all his stupid friends who hadn't believed him were wrong. Dirk looked around the area near the hatch. It was dark with mildew, but the face mask and breathing hoses were there. Dirk remembered that at this point an attendant always helped to get you hooked up, but amazingly he remembered what to do. The face mask was cloudy, or was cloudy, so Dirk spit in it and wiped it as clean as he could with his discarded shirt. Once he had had it clear enough, he tried to put it over his head. It was too tight, so he took it off and loosened the strap. He put it back on, and this time it felt fine. He reached for the mouthpiece attached to the breathing tube, wiped it with his shirt too, and then put it in his mouth. Immediately, oxygen began flowing through the tube. Good. Everything still worked. Dirk couldn't smile with the, mouth with the mouthpiece in, but if he could have, he would have. This was it. He was about to be reunited with Felix. He reached out and turned the dog on the hatch door. It turned easily, and he was surprised. He expected it to be rusted. Taking a deep breath to calm his heart, which was practically doing jumping jacks, Dirk lowered himself into the tube. As soon as he did, the hatch slammed closed with a clank, and the current pulled him along the tube, away from the hatch. Dirk flipped over and looked at the hatch as he was drawn by the flowing water away from the door and further to the tube. He frowned. What was bothering him about that door? Something. Before he could think through whatever it was that was niggling him, uh, niggling at him, he was carried toward another hatch, a few feet down from the one that he'd used to get in the tube. Huh? Oh, right, okay. This one was on the side of the tube instead of the top. I got confused for no reason. Dirk was a little too nervous about the closed hatch he'd just come through, but he was also excited about seeing Felix. Would the shark come out of the second hatch? Dirk couldn't remember. The second hatch opened. Beyond the portal it was dark, but enough light had reached through the hatch doorway to reveal slow movement within. Dirk strained to see through the gloom. At first he couldn't make out anything. And then suddenly a huge blunt nose appeared, and Felix glided silently through the hatch. Startled, Dirk flapped his arms in the water. He half spit out his mouthpiece and he had to quickly shove it back in before he swallowed dirty water. His heart rate shot up and he could hear it thrumming in his ears. After all this time, Dirk had thought he'd be so happy to see Felix, but he wasn't happy at all. 
This Felix wasn't the Felix he remembered. Dirk's Felix had, a, had been a sleek, beautiful shark with shiny and smooth blue-grey rubbery skin. He had what? <coughs> Sorry, I got something in my throat. <laughs> he had warm, dark eyes that seemed to communicate both of the sadness Dirk remembered and the desire to connect with whoever came to swim with him. The Felix of Dirk's memories had a mouth full of teeth, yes, but the mouth was always upturned, smiling and benign, not menacing. Time had not been kind to the lonely shark stuck in this dirty water. Felix, even though he wasn't a real shark, appeared to be decomposing. His skin was no longer shiny or sleek. It was mottled, hanging in strips that fluttered out behind Felix as he swam. The ragged openings revealed Felix's corroded endoskeleton. Dirk thrashed in the water as Felix's toothy snout brushed against his side. He flailed to get away from the shark. In seconds, Dirk's eagerness had degenerated into full-blown terror. As Dirk struggled to swim away from Felix, Felix turned to look at him with his one working eye. The other eye was dangling out of Felix's face, a black orb bobbing in the water. Oh. Dirk almost spit out his mouthpiece again when a scream burbled up his throat and tried to erupt out into the water. This wasn't what he expected. This wasn't the way it was supposed to be. He turned away from Felix's one-eyed gaze, but before he did, he tried to find some of the play friendly playfulness he remembered in Felix's expression. It wasn't there. Felix's stare was empty and dead. Rotating away from Felix and swimming hard now, using his feet as flippers, Dirk squinted through his face mask, determined to get back to the entrance hatch as quickly as possible. He had to get out of the tube. Dirk was three-fourths of the way around the tube when his brain supplied the answer to what was bothering him about the entrance hatch. He saw the hatch in his mind's eye, and he knew what his subconscious had already figured out. The hatch had no handle inside the tube. There was no way to open it. Dirk again wanted to scream, but couldn't. Why hadn't Dirk remembered that the attendant was the one who'd stopped the current and let the swimmers out after a lap or two? Why had he believed he could do this by himself? As soon as Dirk had this thought, he noticed he was moving faster through the water, and before he could react, he'd whipped past the entrance hatch again. Looking back over his shoulder, he saw that Felix was closing in on him. Sucking in air through the mouthpiece, Dirk turned and tried to swim harder, but he felt something snag on his pants. He looked back again, and his eyes widened in panic. Felix's teeth were caught in the waistband of his pants. Dirk kicked his legs, but he couldn't get free. He grabbed at the material to try and rip it loose, but all he did was cut his hand on one of Felix's corroded teeth. Pulling back his hand, Dirk noticed he and Felix were getting close to the entrance hatch again. He prepared himself to try and grab it before he shot past. Three, three, two, one. Dirk reached out for the hatch and tried to find something to grip. His hand slid across the metal and he and Felix continued to whoosh around the tube. As the current carried Dirk and Felix forward, Dirk had to face the truth, like the dogged dogmatist had in Louis Louise's novel. Dirk had found what he'd searched for, just as he'd said he would. He'd been right, but no one would ever know it. A whale attempted to exit Dirk's body, and again, the mouthpiece stopped it. All Dirk could do was scream in his mind as he and Felix continued their entwined and endless journey through the bleak, turbid water. Finally, it's over. <laughs> I'm sorry, I that really dragged along at the end there. I'm, I'm starting to lose my voice, so I don't know if you can tell. Um, I will say, really good beginning, I think. It was a really good setup. Really good ending. I, I think the middle was lacking a little bit. <clears throat> and I must say, there are a lot of great ending lines uh, in all of these stories. But this one is really good. I'm going to read it again. All Dirk could do was scream in his mind as he and Felix continued their entwined and endless journey through the bleak, turbid water. It's kind of like a... I don't know. I'm going to try and make a missable details video on this because I, I've actually noticed quite a few details in this that's like quite like parallels and contrasts and stuff. But this is like a like a back and forth like... Screaming in his mind, 
and then like they're like on a journey. It's like journeys are supposed to be happy, you know, and it's and it's like me and Felix are on a journey through the bleak, turbid water. We are completely hopeless. Um, I I really like it. I really like the ending to the story. Um, yeah, it's implied that he dies. I I assume, <laughs> uh, but yeah, it's it's pretty good. It's it's an alright story. It's definitely not one of my favorites. But tell me guys what you think of it uh, in the comments below. Yeah, make sure you subscribe. I will be covering the next story. Uh, there's a little preview. Oh my gosh! Don't read the preview there. Oh no, that's massive spoilers. <laughs> <laughs> this one, this story, ugh, I don't even know what to say about this story, but, um, you're gonna, you're gonna enjoy it, I bet you are, so, um, I will see you next time for the scoop, <laughs> bye.